As a human rights organisation, Trinity Flack is committed to ending racial discrimination in Ireland. The events of 2020 have highlighted the need to further the conversation on racism in this country. In this week's event, you'll hear from an incredible lineup of speakers sharing their personal and professional insights into the topic of racism and hate crime in Ireland. The first of whom is Thomas McCann. He's manager of the Traveller Counselling Service. He's a member of the travelling community and has 35 years experience in advocating for travellers' rights. He played an instrumental role in campaigning for the Equal Status Act, the Traveller Accommodation Act and the National Action Plan Against Racism. Our second guest is Bashir Otukoya. He's a member of the Department of Justice's Anti-Racism Committee. He lectures in EU law and international asylum and immigration law in Griffith College. He's also a PhD student in the UCD Sutherland School of Law and in the UCD School of Politics and International Relations. And our third guest you'll hear from is Mary Connors Aldridge. She's a community worker in Waterford. She's studying to become a barrister at the moment in King's Inns and she's an activist and member of the travelling community. We hope you enjoy this week's event. My name is Thomas McCann. I'm the manager of the Traveller Council Service. I, I'm a traveller, uh, for, uh, for those who mightn't know. Um, I have been involved in travellers' rights uh, for the past um, 35 years or thereabouts. Um, so I have. Um, some of the main campaigns that I've been involved in certainly would have been around the Equal Status Act, uh, the introduction of the Equal Status Act and the Equality Authority around um, you know, and around the National Action Plan Against Racism or some of the campaigns. Um, travellers, just to kind of, and um, as I was saying earlier on, hopefully at some stage it might be um, more beneficial if there was a, um, a question and answer session or if indeed if you want to organise a question and answer session with me, um, people might get more from it because you can then explore and look at some of the reasons around some of the issues. So certainly feel free to come back to me on this. Um, uh, travellers um, it, for travellers are an ethnic minority in, in Irish society uh, and has been living and kind of a nomadic group in Irish society for for centuries. Uh, so they have. Uh, travellers have been excluded and discriminated against, um, you know, uh, for decades, if not centuries. And this the discrimination has taken many forms. Um, uh, and at many different levels, uh, whether this is at an individual level in terms of name calling or bullying, or whether it's at an institutional level in terms of exclusion from uh, goods and services or indeed legislation. Um, an example of legislation might be, you know, um, kind of um, the anti trespass uh, legislation, which uh, criminalizes nomadism and, uh, you know, and indeed. Um, you know, uh, William Binchy, who was in, who's in the School of Law in Trinity, looked at this issue and has been kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, has um, worked with us when this was coming into play to try and get it stopped. Because uh, in my opinion, and I mean, it might be worth looking at for others, that it's unconstitutional. Uh, so it is because in the lack of uh, defence in it for people because it's within 48 hours. You move your uh, mobile home or your caravan. Once there's a complaint made, you have to move it within 48 hours, otherwise the caravan can be confiscated. Now, in terms of uh, you know eviction, under other laws, people have time to mobilize a defense and organize a defense. There is no um, such um, accommodation in the anti-trespass legislation and I think you know for that and other, many other reasons uh, but this law effectively has uh, criminalized travelers and has only been really ever used I don't know if it ever been uh, used against any settled people it's only been used against travelers so um, but that's an example of it there's many other examples that I could give but I think it'd be worth people uh, having a look at um, at the legislation to see you know um, um, uh, racism discrimination um, impacts on every aspect of travellers' lives, whether that's from education, uh, health, uh, including mental health, um, uh, 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 accommodation, um, employment, you know, uh, and also uh, social activities, simple social activities like going out, whether it's for a drink or whether it's to the cinema, 
you know, kind of, uh, it can impact, and like shopping, I mean, you know, an everyday experience, you know, the necessary experience as well, necessary, necessity, uh, where, you know, people are followed around shops, uh, you know, and that's, that's common experience, you know, uh, hotels for weddings or, you know, and, uh, you know, you get this, uh, uh, we, we, you know, uh, uh, response when you ask why, you know, uh, people are not let in. Uh, we had some of your people here before and, you know, and there would be no more relation between the people who have been there before than, you know, than any settled person who goes in and says, you know, well, we had some of your people there before, you know. So it's completely, you know, uh, but it really has uh, and, and is impacting on travellers' lives and on the quality of travellers' lives. And indeed, on life chances, uh, you know, uh, uh, right across the board. So, um, and it's there. In in 2000, um, there was a campaign, um, an equality campaign that went on for many uh, decades, actually. And in 2000, uh, the Equal Status Act was introduced, which um, identified nine grounds. Um, uh, uh, and one of them was, uh, uh, travellers was included, um, uh, uh, in one of the nine ground, one of the nine grounds, um, and uh, indeed, you know, the Equality Authority was established to support that, and no, a number of travellers um, uh, took cases uh, through that, uh, and I was on the board of the Equality Authority for the first eight years, um, uh, and I saw the cases coming through, you know, um, and however. There was a kind of a, wa a watering down of that, um, where the Equality Authority went, uh, the Equality Tribunal went, and um, um, now cases, you know, it's much more difficult for travellers to get the support. Although you have the Equality and Human Rights Commission in place, it's much more difficult for travellers to take cases, due to a whole lot of factors in terms of lack of resources, lack of education, lack of support. And then if you're taking cases against institutions, or, you know, businesses, they have resources, they have the know-how and they have the, the knowledge. So it's very difficult for people to take cases, um, even though the, the legislation is there. Um, the, other piece of, the other piece of legislation is the Incitement to Hatred Act, which was introduced in 1989. And, um, and um, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, um, there's been, as far as I know, there's, there hasn't been a case under the Incitement to Hatred Act taken, even though many people have said a lot of things about travellers and particularly journalists, you know, uh, kind of, but because the legislation wasn't, um, you know, strong enough or didn't have the teeth, it, no cases was taken. And there's been some, you know, uh, examples where, you know, where it did try to be uh, taken, but it wasn't strong enough. So there's a, there's a need uh, for to change this and I think that's recognised right across the board and I think there has been consultation in this. There's a need to have strong anti-hate speech legislation uh, introduced that people can use and that it is there for, for people to use, you know, uh, because like in terms of uh, in the, uh, one of the things in terms of uh, anti-prohibition uh, uh, of incitement to hatred is proven that somebody was inciting hatred. The, you know, it's very difficult to prove that actually somebody was inciting hatred. And again, you know, people have found a way ar around saying things, you know, um, and uh, not only journalists, but many others as well that was in positions of power and positions of influence. And, um, you know, uh, and it really needs to be addressed that people, not, not just travellers, but uh, uh, across the board can... Uh, take a case uh, against because it's through the media and why I'm fo focusing on journalists is through the media that kind of that a lot of the negative stories came across from about travellers a lot of the you know and there was at one stage I, I believe uh, you know kind of um, that you know that journalists could say what they want about travellers and they weren't going to be challenged on it you know and I think you know people need to be protected and it's the, the role of the state to protect people. And I think, uh, you know, kind of, and I think that's what's uh, needed. Um, uh, so, so there's a clear need for that, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for, um, for strong anti-hate speech. However, I would say that in terms of, you know, uh, 
you know, kind of um, besides that, there's a need for a, a national anti-racism uh, uh, strategy, uh, so there is, to, you know, to uh, try and uh, combat racism across the board because, you know, kind of we can see, you know, the, uh, the dangers of, of racism uh, uh, so we can, and we can see that, you know, that, that without a uh, kind of a strong um, uh, group or body to, to make sure that there is training, that there is structures put in place and that there is a plan. There used to be a national anti-racist plan and uh, there was a body there called the NCCRI uh, to, uh, to do that. Unfortunately, as I said earlier on, there was a, a, a dilution of a lot of that, them structures and the NCCRI was one of the casualties in that. Uh, likewise, the Equality Authority, the Equal Status, uh, or the, uh, the Equality Authority, uh, the Equality Tribunal, and a, n a number of other bodies was, you know, uh, was a casualty of that. So there's a very strong need for a body to actually ensure that there's, that there's strong anti-racism anti uh, training and legislation in place and that uh, groups are kind of uh, and, and particularly education because you know the, uh, racism and discrimination can be unintentional as well you know and I think you know we, we have a, a very diver diverse uh, population at the minute I think about 14% of the population is of, of non-Irish origin that's besides travel community and other communities who has been here so it's really important you know, that we build an inclusive society. And if we're going to do that, we need to make sure that the structures is there, you know, because in, where intentions is very good, uh, you know, we need to go beyond intentions and goodwill. We need to have structures in place that support people. And when they are wronged or when they are excluded or when they are discriminated against, that they can take a, a case, uh, you know, and have the supports to do that. Um, I think that's as much as I'll say now, uh, so, uh, but as I say, uh, uh, I think to, uh, to get a bit more out of it, maybe it'd be good to have a, 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 you know, a session where there's questions and answers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Bashir Tukoya, and I'm a PhD student in the UCD Sutherland School of Law and also in the School of Politics and International Relations, which is also in UCD. I'm a senior law lecturer in Griffith College Dublin, where I teach European Union law, international asylum and immigration law, and also international public law. You're very welcome to this virtual talk, which is hosted by Trinity's Free Legal Advice Centre, FLAC for short, uh, which is looking at the area of racism and hate crime in Ireland. And I have some expertise in that, in the sense that I am a member of the Anti-Racism Committee, which is a new independent uh, body, which was established by the Department of Justice uh, just June of this year, in the wake of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement globally. But racism isn't something we think about every day. I mean, there's only about 1.06% of uh, people in Ireland who identify as being black here in Ireland. So that's a very low number, 1.06%. And to that extent, and to kind of broaden that uh, number a little bit, there's only about 12% of the population uh, that, are a, that are considered foreigners here in Ireland. And all of these groupings, the 12%, um, it's fair to say that they experience some form of discrimination, discrimination in one sense or another, or downright pure racism. We don't pay the time and attention we ought to pay to those who are victims of racism. We don't think about it because it is far removed from our own experiences. And when I say our, I of course mean uh, white, uh, ethnic white Irish people. And so, to help understand this issue more, I want to talk a little bit about, for the next five minutes, four areas which I believe adds to the ineffectiveness of hate crime legislation here in Ireland. Hate crime legislation is important, not least to act as a deterrence for those who might engage in racial or discriminatory acts against other groups that that person perceives as inferior 
or at the very least, to act as a protection for those victims of hate crime. For the purpose of this video, I'm not going to define racism because we, by this stage, should have a broader understanding of what racism is or what racial discrimination is. And to that extent, I will not be defining concepts such as hate or hate crime. For that, I hope that you will do your due diligence and go out and uh, research those topics or those definitions. Now, just to be clear, Ireland does have a hate crime legislation, that being the Prohibition of Incitement to Hatred Act of 1989 which is, by the way, Ireland's only piece of hate crime legislation. But that piece of legislation is ineffective. It's ineffective because the Act only makes it an offence to create or distribute racist, homophobic or other discriminatory materials. So, a person found guilty of breaking this law can face a maximum of two years in prison and a fine of €10,000. So whilst the 1989 Act might be useful in combating hate speech, which is a subset of uh, hate crime, though, of course, its usefulness is yet to be reported, it completely neglects an opportunity to prohibit hate crime. And so to tackle hate crime, the Department of Justice is currently working on a hate crime legislation to replace the 1989 Act, owing to its ineffectiveness. The 1989 Act is ineffective for a number of reasons. There's a lack of data on hate crime to start with. The ineffectiveness of the police in recording hate crime itself. The lack of care for minority groups display, uh, displayed by the police. And the ineffectiveness of judicial discretion. These are four focal issues I think are important areas to work on if we are serious about creating a hate crime legislation which protects those it aims to protect. Let's start with the first one, lack of data. And this is important because if we're not collecting data on uh, the amount of times hate crime is being uh, perpetrated, uh, the types of victims, the type of crimes, the types of hate-related motivations, they all need to be recorded so we can build a coherent and complete picture of the type of uh, 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 hate crimes that we ne need to legislate for in the first place. Since 1989, there have been 44 prosecutions. Since the year 2000, only five of those prosecutions have been convicted. And of those convictions, only two resulted in imprisonment. So these figures are not a numeric representation of the level of hate crime here in Ireland, but rather they evidence the lack of care from state bodies, uh, predominantly on Garda Shia for those groups most in need of protection, and in which such need the 1989 Act aims but fails to satisfy. And so this lack of care is witnessed first and foremost by the lack of data on hate crime from the Central Statistics Office, for example, or from Angada Shiakana itself. Indeed, the Committee on the Enumeration of Racial Discrimination have un often concluded about the lack of or inconsistency on the collection of statistics on the ethnic composition of the population. Now, one may argue, however, that the lack of care is somewhat justified, but still inexcusable. Ireland is a relatively new country of immigration, where before the last three decades, race-related crimes were almost hypothetical in a homogeneously white population. But nevertheless, crimes of hatred based on sexual orientation and on membership to the tribal community, though also underreported, they've also always been well known to be commonplace in local Irish communities. Indeed, it was on this basis that the 1989 Act itself was established. And so the reportedly low level of hate crime in Ireland cannot be blamed on a lack of care alone. Though this is the primary cause. And just to be clear, <laughs> the term lack of care is used in this context as a diplomatic synonym to the more extreme terminologies connoting discriminatory practices perpetrated 
against the protected groups listed in Section 1 of the 1989 Act. In October 2008, for example, just to expand on what I mean by a lack of care from state bodies, the Morris Tribunal published the final report on serious allegations of Gada corruption and misconduct and found that a them and us culture operated within the Gada force. Just recently, uh, Inspector David uh, McInerney uh, wrote a, a book entitled The Realities of Policing Diverse Communities from Minority and Police Perspectives. And in that book, he demonstrated that many members of the Gada Shia Kona harbored racist attitudes towards minority communities, resulting in racial profiling or failure to record or investigate hate crimes. Therefore, it is unreasonable to expect victims of hate crime to report such crimes to Ngada Shiakana when it is generally assumed that the report will be inaccurately recorded, investigated, or maybe even concluded. And the recent EU strategy on victims' rights also acknowledges that victims of crimes belonging to disadvantaged or vulnerable communities or minorities may have low trust in public authorities, and that prevents them from reporting crime. On data uh, recording, victims of hate crime or non-crime hate incidents are encouraged to report these incidents directly to Ongada Konsh Shirkana. And what they do uh, is record that statement on the uh, Pulse database. And Pulse allows for the entry of one of 11 different discriminatory motives since 2015. And that includes ageism, anti-disability, anti-Muslim, anti-Roma, anti-Semitism, anti-traveller, gender-related, homophobia, racism, sectarianism, and transphobia. Following this, a investigation into the incident is uh, engaged in. However, there remains a widespread issue of improper data entry into the Pulse system. And that has led to crimes being entered without their hate-based motivation being logged. And it's been noted by several observers that the hate crimes that are reported to Gardi represent only a fraction of the hate incidents that actually occur, meaning Garda statistics in this area cannot be considered accurate reflections of the level of hate crime in Irish society. In fact, the Central Statistics Office now plays the Garda statistics they publish under reservation and on, uh, and, and on several occasions have ceased to publish these statistics entirely due to concerns over their accuracy. When it finally gets to the court, and this is the final issue, there's no legal onus on the judge to consider any racist motivation in this context, or indeed whether they understand those types of hate-related motivations in their context. And practitioners have often reported that such motivation is not frequently considered when a sentence has been determined which, as noted by Haynes and Sharp, can lead to an uneven judicial approach to hate-related cases. So of the 44 prosecutions I mentioned earlier, which was initiated under the 1989 Act, 22 cases were struck out or dismissed by the court, and seven were withdrawn by the Director of Public Prosecutions. Moreover, as reported by the State to the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, the police have recorded just seven incidents under Section 2 of the 1989 Act since 2014. Just seven. And only two cases go in for prosecution. So therefore, victims of hate crime are often cared for by non-state organizations, such as INR, for example. And they annually publish their own report on hate crime. And since 2013, when they set up this iReport mechanism, which is an online database, 2,841 incidents of racism have been reported on their website, contrary to the uh, seven incidents that were recorded by the police. So the discrepancy between these figures indicate that whilst people whom ought to be protected by the 1989 Act have recourse to reporting their experiences, however ineffective in utility, those recordings, they have little to no access to justice. But more importantly, they don't have access to mental health care in a similar manner of that provided to victims of other trauma-inducing crimes. And that, perhaps, shows the greatest lack of care from state bodies 
whom ought to have regard to the protection of minorities living here in Ireland. I'm going to end the video there. I want to thank you for watching or listening. Hello, uh, my name is Mary Connors Aldridge and I am a community youth worker in Waterford. I'm a student of legal studies at the King's Inns and I'm also a member of the Irish Driver community. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to talk today around discrimination for travellers. And I'd also like to say that it's really encouraging to know that this topic has been highlighted for current and future practitioners, both as a student myself, but also as a member of the travelling community. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about experiences of travellers in discrimination. And I'd like to share with you some of my own examples of where I've experienced this. Um, to start off with, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about the background and some statistics regarding travellers and discrimination. I don't think it would be unfair to say that many people, um, when they hear the term traveller, may have a stereotype in their mind um, of a way that maybe a traveller might look or sound or behave. But the travelling community is as diverse as generally the settling community. Um, we vary vastly um, from family to family and area to area. But despite this, what we do share is an overwhelming experience of discrimination in our day-to-day -day lives. The travelling community represents um, less than 1% of the general public. There is just over 36,000 Irish travellers in Ireland. And in fact, I think we represent 1.6% of the population. Despite this being such a small percentage, the travelling community experiences disproportionate levels of discrimination. To put this into some contents, I'd like to share with you uh, some statistics. Um, a survey that was conducted by the National Advocacy Committee on Drugs found that when questioning the settling community, they found 36% of people asked admitted that they would openly avoid travellers. 97% said that they would not accept a traveller in their family. 80% said that they would not have a traveller as a friend. And 44% said that they wouldn't want a traveller to be a member of their community. Uh, a couple of other statistics, just for contents, is that travellers are 10 times more likely to experience discrimination in seeking work than members of the settling community. Travellers are 22% more likely to dis experience discrimination in shops, pubs and restaurants. And 40% of travellers experience discrimination in accessing health services. The last statistic I'd like to share with you, I think is quite relevant um, for this discussion, and that's the fact that though the traveling community only represents less than 1% of the general population, the Irish Prison Service estimates that travellers account for 22% of the female prison population and 15% of the male population um, in the prison service. And also, it is suggested that their sentences are disproportionately more um, extreme. So in considering this, um, I think it's quite fair and understandable to say that the travelling community is among the most disadvantaged and marginalised group in Ireland. Um, they commonly fare badly in all the indicators of disadvantageness or disadvantage um, which is levels of unemployment, poverty, social exclusion, health statistics, there's higher levels of infant mortality, much shorter life expectancy, I believe the average is um, 11 years compared to the general population, um, and there's dramatically lower levels of formal education or higher education and training, and much higher levels of um, illiteracy. The travelling community, as I've said, experiences extreme levels of racism, discrimination and social exclusion, 
on a personal basis, but also on an institutional level. Um, in Ireland, historically, we've seen laws, in fact, that have tried to um, rehabilitate, as, as they have put it, or settle the travelling community in the past. Um, and if you want to look further into this, you can look at the report of the Commission for Itinerance in 1963. Um, and that report very much looked at travellers as a problem. Um, you know, so that's kind of the historical basis of, of travellers' experience in Ireland. Now, in more modern times, you know, we've definitely seen improvements. Um, under the Equal Status Act in 2000, um, being a member of the travelling community was identified as um, as a, a bracket in which people can be discriminated against. Um, and also in 2017, the Irish government officially acknowledged uh, travellers as their own ethnic, ethnic group. Um, and I'm today, I'm wearing my traveller ethnicity pin, which was um, issued for that event, which is a lovely um, wagon wheel with the Irish harp in the middle of, of it, which is really nice. Um, now, that's wonderful to see, but unfortunately, um, in reality, there's still very much um, high levels of experience of discrimination for travellers. So, I suppose now would be a good time to talk a little bit of, of what that actually looks like or what that's like uh, for the traveling community. Um, travelers experience a lot of open abuse um, in Ireland. I've often heard it said that um, discrimination towards travelers is the last form of openly accepted discrimination. Um, travellers report that they would hear a, a lot of verbal abuse. Um, travellers are referred to as pikeys, knackers. Uh, sometimes people use the term tinker um, in a derogative term. Uh, you'd see examples in Ireland of houses being burnt um, by community members um, in an effort to stop travellers moving into the area. And if you have been on Facebook recently or on social media, you might have seen that Tyson Fury, uh, the Gypsy King, um, was part of um, a protest or I suppose a movement maybe um, recently um, in response to travellers being refused entry into a, a pub in somewhere in England. Um, and that kind of treatment, refusal of entry to services, that's really, really common. I myself have experienced that um, refusal to enter restaurants, um, bars, hotels, um, other services, just purely because maybe we've walked in with a group. The group has been identified as travellers more than likely in areas that we've never been to before and we'll just be greeted at the door and told that either there's no space, um, all the tables are booked. I've been told in the past um, on a night out with some of my cousins that we couldn't enter a premises because there was a private function um, despite that not being advertised on the door or the website or being quite obviously not the case at the time. Um, some of the other experiences that travellers have is they would have um, difficulty in accessing housing and accommodation. Funded Funding has been provided by the government um, to, to build purpose-built housing for travellers um, and a lot of councils have failed on numerous years to um, use this funding and to set up um, such housing. Um, there's large, large, a large database of examples of online abuse, um, slander and discrimination. Um, I'm part of a few Facebook groups that talk around, or talk a bit about traveler discrimination and on a bi-daily basis, if that makes sense, multiple times a day. Um, people share examples of comments um, 
and a derogative term is being used um, in different situations on the internet. Um, I suppose one example that I'd really like to share with you um, is in my own experience um, when I was looking to book my wedding venue. Um, I attended a open day um, of a hotel, a wonderful, beautiful hotel, and um, we were shown around and we were greeted and uh, myself and my husband now um, were treated very nicely um, and shown around the hotel on the open day. Um, and then once I made contact with the hotel using my email address, which states my surname, um, all of a sudden I couldn't get a response or I was being told that there was issues with the bookings and um, that they'd get back to me and they'd get back to me. And, and after about a couple of months, I, um, well, I think it was clear quite early on, but I persisted and um, in the end I was avoided. Um, and I actually experienced this with three separate hotels. Um, so I think personally, I think it's quite clear um, that, you know, my my surname proved a barrier there. So why is this important to talk about? Besides the fact that obviously it's not very nice. Um, but, you know, the traveling community um experiences this very often and like i said my belief is it's on a daily basis um and yet there are very low numbers of travelers that are firstly even pursuing a remedy for this mistreatment but also there's an even smaller percentage of um cases where the outcome has been in favor of travelers and that is a very big barrier. I, I personally believe that one of the biggest barriers in in changing this is actually addressing the, the traveling community's belief that they can actually ask for different treatment or stand up and 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 say I'm not being treated fairly. Um, but you know, like as someone who's interested in law and, and it's part of a big reason why I've chosen to study law, um, you know, my belief is that it, this isn't fair. And, you know, tarring people with the same brush um, is is wrong. It's wrong for all groups. And I'm, I'm sure that other groups who are talking today will have similar experiences and similar beliefs. Um, but there has been such a small percentage of um, examples, positive examples that we can turn to, to say, look, the, the legal system has acknowledged um, your right to equal treatment or fair treatment. Um, so it's very hard to encourage traveling members to step forward and to have the belief that they can be um, supported by the legal system. Um, often members of the traveling community, if they don't openly fit a stereotype, um, might actually hide the fact that they're members of the traveling community because they're afraid that it might stop them getting work or access to services or that they might be treated differently by people in the community, um, which is really quite a shame. Um, I suppose, finally, I, I would just like to say that, um, you know, as as a traveller myself um, and as someone who really does believe um, in change, I mean, I've been a community youth worker for many, many years and, and, and my fundamental belief is that, you know, I believe in equality and fairness. But after years and years of, ex of experience of, of constant visual discrimination and, and discrimination through services and, and hearing comments and hearing professionals even, um, you know, using derogative terms, um, people who, who really should know better and would in other circumstances never consider um, talking about certain groups in, in a way that was so demeanoring. But 
discriminating against travellers is so embedded in this country. I've had co-workers um, who have made derogative terms and not realised that that was actually not OK, because actually all their lives, society has told them it's OK to discriminate against travellers. Travellers are less than. Um, so it's a very hard battle to try and um, fight against that current and it can be really demotivating um, so I I suppose my main aim here is to share with you as future practitioners the fact that by the time a traveller comes in to your office it's they've already fought a very hard battle to get to the point where they are even ready to to accept there's a chance that the law um, will stand up for them. Um, well, I'm going to leave it there. So thank you very much for your time. And um, if there, if you're looking for any more information, there's the really good sources online. The Irish Traveller Movement is a really good website. Um, and also Pavy Point has some really good resources. So thank you very much and have a good day.